General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing, Pat Cullen, has been speaking at the Union's Congress in Brighton. And in a wide-ranging speech, she talked about the government's unwillingness to meaningfully negotiate and criticise their plan to introduce nursing apprenticeships. But there's one area of Cullen's speech that I really do want to focus on. Let's, let's take a look. Colleagues, nursing in the United Kingdom is fantastically international. Diversity is one of our many strengths as a profession and as a royal college. We are working ever more closely with internationally educated colleagues and diaspora groups to make sure the RCN meets the needs of all members. We will lead on an anti-racist agenda. In this hall alone, there will be colleagues who completed their education and perhaps started their careers in Africa, in Asia, and in the Americas. Whether somebody comes to this country ready to work as a highly skilled nurse, or they arrive as a political refugee, fleeing war or persecution, or they simply want a new and prosperous life in the UK, they are beyond welcome. And that should not need saying. But let me say something very, very simple. The way this government talks about migration sickens me. Our country deserves a better, more informed and celebratory national conversation, especially in this anniversary year of Windrush. Colleagues from anywhere around the world, near or far, you are very, very welcome. You are welcome and much needed in the NHS and in the care system. It is your home as much as it is my home. God, wouldn't it be so refreshing to hear a Labour politician talk about migration in that tone? Instead, we have to look to our union leaders to actually stand up from the people from all around the world who work to keep our public services together. Wouldn't it be great to hear any politician, really, from any party, talk about having, quote, a celebratory national conversation. Instead, this is what we get from our current leaders. Afghan families in Yorkshire issued with eviction letters from Suella Braverman. Refugees, including a special forces soldier, a political advisor, receive notice to quit letters from Home Secretary. Personally delivered, I imagine. It's worth stressing that this is a story about Afghan refugees who worked for our government during the occupation of Afghanistan. The Guardian reports this. The letters were delivered after the UK government announced in March it would move all 24,500 Afghans out of temporary bridging accommodation or hotels this year and said that they must accept the first offer of accommodation from the Home Office. The letter said, quote, For the avoidance of doubt, if possession is not delivered upon by the notice date, you will be a trespasser and the sector of straight for the Home Department shall be at liberty to evict you from your property. Can you imagine Suella Braveman turning up with that smug smile outside your door and telling you you've got to get out now? Because she would do that. I think she would just go herself. Now, these are the same families that were the centre of this story published in March. Afghan refugees told to leave London say they lost jobs and school places. In February, the families were uprooted from a London hotel and moved to Weatherby in Yorkshire, not to houses, but to yet another hotel. They reported doctor's appointments, operations and jobs being lost because of the move. And a month after the they were relocated, three GCSE students and other children as young as five were still without school places. And now they're being forced to move again. But this time, the government hasn't offered them new accommodation, despite promising to. And the Home Office isn't helping them find accommodation of their own. The Guardian goes on to report this. The families, including a special forces soldier, translator and a political advisor, say they have attempted to find homes themselves, but have been thwarted by slow bureaucracy within the Home Office and local councils. 
Mohammed, one of the Afghan residents, said he had found and then lost two available properties in outer London after problems that the Home Office could not solve. He said, quote, There has been problems for all of us, with either the guarantor, the deposit, or the eligibility of the local authority or not having a job. This has all been made worse because we have been moved from London to Yorkshire, leaving jobs and contacts behind. The refugees are part of the government's sickly and falsely named Operation Warm Welcome Resettlement Scheme. For some of them, it will be the fourth time they've had to change home in 18 months. A reminder that moving home is apparently more stressful than divorce. We do not treat our Afghan refugees well at all. But don't worry, we treat our asylum seekers even worse. And hell-bent on making their lives as miserable as possible, Rishi Sunak has travelled to Iceland today. Why? to ask the top European Court of Human Rights judges to reform the way the court works and ditch the Rule 39 orders that were used to ground Rwanda flights last year. The Times explains it here. In a meeting with Shiofra O'Leary, President of the European Court of Human Rights, the Prime Minister will make a personal appeal for her to back Britain's attempt to change rules that meant the first scheduled deportation flight to Rwanda was blocked at the last minute in June. They will meet in Reykjavik at a rare summit of the Council of Europe, the 46th member group of countries founded after the Second World War. The UK is trying to reform the European Court's use of interim injunctions to ensure that they cannot be used to arbitrarily block deportation flights. It has requested that the court introduce a higher legal threshold for applicants to seek an injunction. It also wants to be able to submit legal representation against injunctions to ensure, quote, proper transparency and allow decisions to be reconsidered. Iceland's foreign minister, Tordis Gilfadottir, has appeared on Radio 4's The World at One, where she seemed to pour cold water on Sunak's grand plans. The British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, one of his aims today is to raise the idea that the international migration system is not working. Is Mm -hmm. he right? Do you accept that? This summit has not a big focus on that. The, the, the biggest focus is, of course, uh, Ukraine and then other issues such as uh, AI and environment and other things. So there, this summit is, doesn't have a big focus on, on mm. migration in general, but I agree that that is an issue for Europe. And, uh, of course, that system has to develop with the challenges that we face. Indeed. Well, it it is a big, obviously, it's a big issue for the Prime Minister and this government. And that's Mm -hmm. partly because the European Court of Human Rights used something called Rule 39 regulation to block deportations to Rwanda. And the Prime Mm -hmm. Minister now wants to reform that rule. And just to, we should explain that it's in Rule 39, it's an interim measure. It means that anybody who's applying would otherwise face an imminent risk of irreparable damage and then the court imposes something which actually countries may or may not abide by. But the UK wants to reform that. Will other European countries, will Iceland, agree to have a look at it and consider changing it? What I can say in general regarding legitimacy and the court, that uh, this is one of the issues we are addressing here in Reykjavik. Um, The leaders are reconfirming their commitment to the common human rights protection system, and in particular the court as a cornerstone of our protection system. And of course, this is a continuous dialogue between states and the Council of Europe on how to best ensure that this system is addressing our needs today, as well as in particular how we can support the implementation of judgment by states. But the next two days, we are the, the time we have, we are not uh, using to reform certain articles about uh, or in the court. I think one of the things that's really interesting and something that shows just how much of an outlier the UK is right now is that our ruling Conservative Party has more in common, I think, with the likes of Victor Orban or even Donald Trump in terms of what function they think the judiciary ought to serve, which is if there is a strongly independent judiciary, well, they want it to be quite weak in terms of what kinds of decisions they're able to make. So if the government wants to deport traumatized asylum seekers to Rwanda, no matter what claims they have pending here, well, they want to be able to do that without the judiciary interfering and saying, well, hang on, you're breaching all other kinds of laws and legal rights that these individuals have here. They want to weaken the ability of the judiciary 
to function independently of the government. But what the likes of, you know, Victor Orban and Donald Trump want is, well, they're happy with a strong judiciary, one which is capable of making quite politically transformative decisions, so long as it's in line with the government or a particular political faction's priorities and interests. Now, that's something that you've seen in Poland, it's something you've seen in Hungary, is something that you've seen with the partisanship of the Supreme Court. And so when you put a question to another European leader about, well, you know, Rishi Sunak wants to change the way these courts function, basically, so that you've got a higher threshold for intervention. That way, the government can get away with deporting absolutely who it likes. Well, you've got other European leaders saying courts aren't meant to work that way. We really are an outlier. I just want to reflect back on the treatment of refugees and asylum seekers in this country and just how disruptive and stressful and I think cruel the policies of dispersal are. So I wish I could say that it was those nasty conservatives who introduced the policy of dispersal, which is moving asylum seekers and refugees away from city centres and London in particular and into other parts of the country. But that was actually a new labor policy. And it was something which resulted in the early 2000s in a lot of racial attacks, abuse and harassment of asylum seekers because they'd been uprooted from bits of the country where they might be able to find some community and dispersed into areas which tended to be poorer and also were a lot less diverse. So they were unable to find those bonds of community, of cultural understanding and help. And it was something which resulted in an awful lot of division. Now, that was something which, you know, you saw up and down in the country, but quite notably places like Peterborough, like Oldham, like other bits of Yorkshire. It was a labour policy. And I think it was a really nasty one, a really bad one. And so when you've got people being dispersed in that way, and you so eloquently explained the disruption to healthcare and to education, you've also got an effect of making people feel like they don't really have a home here, that they're not going to be able to put down roots, settle in, and do exactly what it is these politicians are always complaining about, which is integrate which is participate in society, participate in public life. There's another, I think, barrier to that happening in the way that it should, which is, again, as a result of new labor policy, asylum seekers are unable to work while their claims are being processed for at least a year. Now, other countries don't do it that way. Australia and Canada and Sweden, if you're an asylum seeker, you can apply for a job and start working legally straight away. In Portugal, it's one month. In Germany, it's three months. In Belgium, it's four months. Now, these are all examples of countries where asylum seekers are able to work. It means that they're able to have a life outside of whatever accommodation they've been placed in. And of course, it's something which you know re- reduces the impact on the treasury because they're able to do things like pay tax. They're also able to do things like pay for more of their costs and expenses while they're here. And it's something that asylum seekers really want to do. Many asylum seekers report the impact on their mental health, the feelings of loneliness and purposelessness, because while they're waiting for their claims to be assessed by the home office, they're just stuck in limbo with nothing to do, nowhere to go apart from, you know, the hostel or hotel where they've been placed. Now, these are all really common sense policies, which is, okay, where are you going to seek out accommodation for asylum seekers? Maybe it should be in a place where they can experience a sense of community. Hmm. Do you want asylum seekers being totally and 100% in every case reliant on the state? Or do you want them to be able to work? Well, because New Labour at that time was trying to pander to an anti-asylum moral panic, which was being whipped up by Rupert Murdoch's stable of newspapers, we've ended up with the worst of all worlds. So you've got the policy of dispersal. You've got people being moved on really frequently, disrupting their ability to make friends, get an education, 
find rele relevant healthcare, hold down jobs, and you've also got them being prevented from working while their claims are being assessed. And that's the thing about the kind of immigration policy that we have in this country, which is it's so nasty, it has ceased to be rational or efficient. Thank you.